This morning we are going to be in 1 John. But rather than chapter 4, we're going to be in chapter 3. And we're going to talk about the love of God. Now the way that we've approached Advent this year is is to say the steady diet of what it is that we teach here is a hope in what's to come, right? That's that's the emphasis of Scripture. It's it's not about the, the current in this exact moment and the circumstances that we're in and the blessings that can come here and now. The idea has always been that we would focus on that which is to come as the Bible focuses on that. But we also understand that there is an already but not yet aspect to our salvation, which means this, although we will one day see him face to face, and all will be renewed, we are even now a new creation. And in his presence, even now, And so when we talk about love, I want to talk about love now. Generally, I would say let's talk about what it means to be compelled to love. But I also want to talk about what it means to be loved. I was I was listening to the radio this morning or this morning, this week. I was listening to the radio this week, and there was a a mental health expert um, from university in Southern California. And she was calling in to CBC Radio. They were hosting her. She's Canadian. And, and they were asking her questions about what it means to cope with the holidays. Because even on the best of years, the holidays can be a tricky time for those who deal with anxiety, depression, those who have dealt with loss. It can be a lonely time. And so they brought her on and they were saying, what are some things that we can do? How can we handle the difficult parts of the holidays as they are amplified in their difficulty this particular year? And this is the advice that was given. And and not only the advice that was given, but the advice that was well received. It's not necessarily surprising that The first thing that she did was say, be grateful for what you have. Look around you and consider what you have. You know what? Maybe you have your health, you have your family, you have your job, you have your home. Whatever it is that you can look around you, look around you and say, I'm grateful for this. To help identify what it is that we can be grateful for. She said, consider the fact that other people aren't as fortunate. And when we look at the misfortune of others, we recognize the things that we do have. So consider your state compared to what others have gone through. And thirdly, she said, smile whether you feel like it or not. Because science has shown that the function of smiling releases endorphins that actually make you feel better. Now, what I'm not going to do is this. The purpose of this is not to just say, well, that's silly. The purpose of this is not to just bring someone down or to pretend that in the expert field of mental health, I am above this woman, but, but this is what I found. It's not a conflict of my opinion versus hers or my skill set as compared to her skill set. It's a comparison of, of worldviews. In a secular worldview, we're told, be grateful for the thing that you have. This is something that's always been peculiar to me, being grateful for the thing that you have and recognizing that as as a good thing. When I consider a secular worldview and, and the way that we even do something like Thanksgiving, I find it I find it interesting, to say the least. It's one thing to be thankful for. 
but I feel compelled for everything that I am thankful for, for there to be tied to it someone to whom I am grateful. And does that make sense? Not only grateful that I have this thing, but grateful that this thing has been given to me. It is just this sort of line that runs along, right? So if, if, if in a secular mindset, I look at this and I think, well, I'm supposed to be grateful for this thing. I think, well, no, if I'm my provider, if I've done the work to create this scenario or to purchase this thing, then what am I, who am I grateful to? Am I, I supposed to be grateful to me? Because this is a product of my hand, what I've earned and what I've gone to get. And then all of a sudden, gratitude feels like a strange thing. Well, I mean, you could be grateful that you had the health and the opportunity. But grateful to whom? Where did health and opportunity come from? The other thing that I find peculiar in this is, is that the statement, one way to, to cope with the mental health and the struggle of a season is to be grateful for things. And then she started listing all of these things. And you know why? Do you know why our world struggles right now more than ever before with mental health issues? Because they don't have their health. or family, or their work, or the roof above their head. And so when we, when we are told, place your hope, place your joy, place your faith in the circumstances that surround you and be grateful for those circumstances, I could just hear as she was giving this simple advice, People screaming from around the country at their radios going, but I don't have those things to be grateful for, and that's the problem. So what am I supposed to do? And in the end, what we end up doing is we say the way to be mentally healthy is to be healthy. And it becomes the rich getting richer. And it becomes empty for the poor, for those who have experienced loss. It sounds good on the surface, but in the end, it's a hollow statement. And I know that at some point we've all said, well, count your blessings because at least you're not in and then named a circumstance of someone less fortunate than you. Can we just bring an end to this statement altogether. At what point is it beneficial for anyone to find their joy in the misfortune of others? Because that's what we're doing when we say, well, at least there are those beneath me. At least I'm not where they are. What we're talking about here, what is being proposed is that we have a hope and we have joy in things that are circumstantial and relative. Based on our circumstances and relative to those who are around us. Which means it is always going to be a moving target. And then lastly, smile. Fake it till you make it. I could see, I could see a situation where a person might be down and they might find themselves saying, okay, I'm going to try this. But a person in real Struggle. How many times can you say to them, just keep smiling, and there will be a chemical shift within you? Although the world around you will remain hopeless, 
and the burden that you bear will not be lightened, let alone removed. You can fool your body into thinking that there's hope. If you just smile. There's a part of me that looks to that and says that it undermines the intelligence of those that we would recommend it to. Maybe it would work once, maybe for a few minutes, but then what? Then what are we left with? Smile more. Search out people less fortunate than you so that you can feel better about yourself. Put the ache out of your mind and only think about those things that are going well in your life when that's not always possible. The world that we live in is temporary. And even their attempts at hope and joy are fleeting. They're circumstantial, they're relative, and they're superficial. I hope that through this Advent series, you would better understand what it means for us to live in a hope and joy, and peace, and love that is not relative, but absolute. That is not circumstantial, but transcendent. That is not fleeting, but eternal. The only way to have that kind of hope is to have hope in someone who is all of these things, transcendent, eternal, and absolute. And when our hope is based on that kind of a God, And when that kind of a God has said, I look to you with compassion and I would love you so much so that I would come, send my son to bear the weight of your sin so that you could be forgiven, so that you don't have to live any longer in this world of brokenness, so that you don't have to face the consequences of your sin and the sin of humanity, but you can live in a restored union with me and all of creation for all of time. When our hope is in a God who makes that kind of promise, then we have peace. Peace that come what may, this life is fleeting. And the joy that I find in the things of this world, which I am not telling you not to find joy in this world. If you think that that's where I'm going, you can just back it up and watch last week's message. But acknowledging that they come and go. My wife has taught my kids to love sunsets. They don't last very long. They don't come every day. But we enjoy them while they're there. But when we find our peace in a God that would make that kind of a promise to us, we can find joy in the things of this world and in the promise of their perfection in a life to come. Love. Love. 1 John 3, 1 says this. You see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. 
and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Now we don't use the word behold very much anymore, and so I understand why more modern translations would change the word behold to see, but I kind of wish they hadn't. There's a different weight given to it, right? To be like, oh, see this, versus behold. One, one calls us to a passing observation, the other one calls us to sit and to take it in, to spend time in it. Although your Bible might say, see, I would call you to behold the love that God has given to you. You remember when we began this series, I read an excerpt from a book about some Ukrainian children being adopted. If you didn't hear that message, you can go back to the beginning of this Advent series and you can hear that. And, and it's such a moving story that you would have these children, these siblings, I believe four of them to be exact, who had, in many cases, even stated that they did not believe that there would ever be a home for them. That, that their plight of being on their own and left to their own strength and devices was something that they had just given themselves to. And then along come a man and a woman from the other side of the world to say, you're mine. If you would have me, I want you to be my child, to give you a name, to be your provider, your guide, to love you. That is what it means for us to be adopted by God the Father. That He would look to us who are dead in our trespasses and sins and would say to us, I have a name for you. I would have you to be mine. I will be your guide and your provider, and I will love you as my own son to the degree that I will give my son to pay your ransom. Raise him, and the two of you will be joint heirs for all of eternity. That is the love that the Father has for us that we would be called the children of God. And so we are. Behold that. Don't just see it. Take it in. Sit in it. Consider it. And give yourself to it. Last week I said that one of the struggles that we find is that there are sometimes those of us who do not allow themselves to experience joy because they feel that 
There is some greater piety, greater holiness in rejecting joys and comforts. I think it is also true that there are many of us that refuse to allow ourselves to be loved. Why? Because we know something about us that other people don't know. Regardless of how intimate our relationship might be with another person, there is always something about us that the other doesn't know. And deep down inside, we know that that person loves us without that knowledge. And that if they had that knowledge of us, they would not love us. But before the foundations of the earth were established, you were known. God is not shocked by who you are, by those dark corners in your heart, the skeletons in your closet. Knowing that they were yet to come, he gave Christ to pay for that sin. Out of love for you. He's not surprised. He's not shocked. That is the very reason he gave his son. Allow yourself to be loved by him. You cannot look to God and say, yeah, but if you only knew. Yeah, but if you only knew, then you would consider me less than desirable. And if you only knew what is going on inside my heart or what has gone on, then things would change. That doesn't work with God. God already knows. In fact, I would make the argument that God knows your heart better even than you do. It might not be that you're hiding dark things from God. It might be that there are dark things inside of us that God knows that we're not even aware of yet. And how piercing the stain of sin is, God is far more aware than we are. Behold, the manner of love the Father has given to us, that we would be called children of God, and so we are. And then he tells us two things about our love, about this love. He says that even now, we are children of God. In verse 2. We are God's children now. Are you yet perfected? No. When, when Paul tells the church at Rome that there is a process to our sanctification, and at the end of that process, there will be glorification where we will be like Christ and we will stand sinless, clean, forgiven, renewed. Well, that awaits. And John, John looks forward to that. John says that we don't even know yet. We don't even know yet what it will be like to be like Christ, but we know that it will come. We know that that glorification will come, so we anticipate a greater love and a greater relationship, but in addition to anticipating, we realize that even now we are children of God. So while we wait 
for that perfection of relationship. What we're waiting for, church, is not to be loved more deeply by God. What we're waiting for is the capacity to love God more deeply. You understand? Our fallen nature, the sin that separates us from God, it does change the way that we live in a love relationship with God. I, I'm not going to pretend like it doesn't. It does. But it only changes our end of it. There is no moment that we are waiting on that will increase the love that God has for us. That act is finished. And He has demonstrated His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So church, I, I want to call you to behold and not just see. This is not a passing truth. This is not something that we read over quickly and say, oh, yeah, of course I know that God loves me. But behold what kind of love the Father has given to us. A love that is not temporary and circumstantial and relative and fleeting, but that a transcendent God would love us despite where we are. Love us out of this fallen nature that he would claim us as his own and allow yourself to be loved in that way. Stop fighting to make yourself lovable. Receive his grace and mercy and grow in your sanctification, in your righteousness, not based on your merit, your capacity to become lovable, but based on the kind of love that He has given to us that we would be called children of God. Let's pray. God, there is so much inside of me that feels like I have to be the one to bring silence to the battles that are going on inside of me. God, that as long as I struggle in this flesh and with this heart, God, you would also struggle to know me. But it's not true. It's not true. It doesn't stop you from knowing me. It doesn't stop you from loving me. God, although my love for you is incomplete, my ability to know you and to see your beauty for all that it is is incomplete. God, the consistency with which I love you is at times pathetic. God, it is me that struggles to love and not you.
And God, in that I find my hope, my peace, and my joy. That I am loved by my Father who knows me. My heart, my circumstances, my past, my present, and my future. And he could not love me more. God, I pray that we as a church would receive that love. God, that it would be peace for us. And that it would lighten the burdens that we carry. God, that our our joy in this season and in all of life, God, would not be baseless, but that it would be fixed on an all-powerful, all-loving God who is above it all. God, I thank you for that love. I thank you for revealing yourself, your plan of redemption to us. God, I thank you for Jesus who is the one who made all of this possible. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.